uh, gathering. And I'd like to open, of course, by thanking my two wonderful partners uh, to this uh, uh, conference, uh, Dr. Boaz Cohen and Dr. Daniela Ozeki uh, uh, Stern for their partnership and their hard work and openness. Uh, and just to say that it was truly a pleasure to work together. And the big question uh, now is what would be our next project? So keep that in mind. But uh, I want to say it's not a, a, a very big coincidence that I am uh, chairing a, a panel on Holocaust memory. Uh, as a historian of Holocaust memory myself, uh, frankly, uh, if it were up to me, uh, the whole uh, uh, conference was uh, oriented uh, to deal with uh, memory. Um, uh, so the panel that we will have today uh, will be uh, very interesting. We will hear a, a variety of topics going uh, from the vanishing body of witnesses uh, through to the forensic turn. Uh, and uh, we will have papers focusing on the virtual um, memory with great relevancy to our current uh, quarantine uh, experiences. And uh, uh, we'll conclude with uh, uh, contemplations on uh, post uh, nostalgia in the memories of second generation. And without further ado, we'll, uh, I would like to uh, invite our first speakers. Um, so uh, we have two speakers here, uh, Professor uh, Jackie Feldman and uh, Dr. Uh, Norma uh, Musi from uh, Ben Gurion University. And they will present their work on the vanishing body of the Shoah witness. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Roni. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, let's, let's hope we... Uh, can you see the presentation? The screen up? Yes. Okay. At present, Holocaust memory is shaped, among others, by two major generational phenomena. The passing away of the last of the eyewitnesses and the shift from analog to easily accessible digital memory. By examining several current media practices, we argue that contemporary digital technologies attempt to preserve the body of the witness and not just his story as the witnesses are passing away. Much has been written on intergenerational transmission of the Shoah from many perspectives. And here we'll focus on one, which is the role of media technologies in generational change. If in the early post-war period, the document and the historian were the authoritative bearers of Holocaust memory, with the advent of the Yale Video Archive, not the words, but the bodily presence of the aging witness, not the words, but the bodily presence of the aging witness becomes the sign of authenticity. The facial expressions, stuttering, and silences become hallmarks of deep memory. In Amit Pinchevsky's words, the technological unconscious of trauma and testimony discourse is the videotape as an audiovisual technology of recording, processing, and transmission or in other words, video technology ushers in the age of the witness. What changes then result from the shift from analog to digital memory, especially as a means of information and communication among the younger generation? And how does this relate to the passing away of the last of the survivor witnesses? Three of the changes incurred by digital technology are that traditions become detached from moorings in particular locales. You don't need to go to the museum or memorial to remember. You may have it on your cell phone. Second, the mediation of tradition becomes detached from personal face-to-face -face interaction, which we're seeing in part right now. National commemorative ceremonies are often seen by youths as boring and unattractive. We'd rather remember together on Zoom and think about what it's like to hold a ceremony on Zoom rather than a conference. 
And third, there's a profusion of easily accessible information and misinformation, and a great, the greater capacity for interactivity bypasses the gatekeepers of knowledge, gatekeepers of memory. We're going to talk here now uh, in the rest of the vanishing body of the witnesses and through three digital practices that express this and see how they relate to the passing away to the last of the survivors. Ricky, can you do a full screen so we will see? Yeah, uh, at the bottom, left or right at the bottom, you have... Uh... That better? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, where were we? Yeah. So let's look at three digital practices that express this and see how they relate to the passing way of the last of the survivor witnesses. Right? Uh, the first is digitally narrated personal artifacts, the second, digital bodies, in particular witness holograms, and the third, selfies in, in sites of memory. So the digitally narrated artifact. Museums like the United States Holocaust Museum and Yad Vashem have collected and exhibited masses of personal artifacts. The objects were to serve as metonyms for the individual victims to tell their story. Um, when the, the new Yad Vashem was inaugurated in 2005, director Avner Shalev told me, Many survivors told me over and over, now we know that we can leave the world. Someone took over the ability to transmit what we wanted to transmit to others through the artifact. Recently, Yad Vashem inaugurated a temporary exhibit, the Artifact of the Month, where the witness is now digitally recorded, as this one here displaying his sweater as a child, as a necessary support and authorization from the, for the objects on display. So, here, digital media is used to support the artifact. But when museums do adopt digital media, um, it often serves as an additional caption with no opportunity for interaction. In general, museums tend to be conservative in their forays into digital media because of their desire to respect the dead, maintain control over the narrative, and assert their authority as caretakers of memory but it's not certain that they and not social media will be the ultimate shapers of the future memory of the Shoah. Second kind of technology, interactive holograms. Since 2012, a number of survivors have been interviewed for about 10 to 15 hours over several days under hundreds, the gaze of hundreds of cameras. The images are then combined to construct a hologram. The answers fed into a program Students are invited then into the museum auditorium, pose questions, and the algorithm generates responsive answers, giving the impression of an ongoing conversation. We suggest that the hologram is a lieu de mémoire, an effort to arrest the flow of time to create something that can guarantee tradition and memory in the future, in this case, by preserving the body of the witness. The technology makes the witness testimony accessible to broad publics of the digital generation and creates a sense of immediacy and presence. But the tears, silences, and stutterings that were the hallmark of the video right, are erased. So that algorithmic holographic holograph, hologram testimony promotes a vision of unencumbered cross-generational interaction in which witnessing is devoid of pain. And third, selfies in memorial sites. Just one minute. Okay, you, you have one minute left. In visits to death camps and memorials, the emptiness and silence of the death camps is often obscured by the forest of selfie sticks and the sounds of clicking shutters. The resulting photos can be framed, tinted, manipulated, and posted everywhere, including on Tinder and Grindr. When gatekeepers like the head of Auschwitz Museum object, right, don't take selfies of balancing acts on the tracks, it's inappropriate, the rebuke engenders talkbacks on the part of visitors, and with each reply, the curators of the memory lose their authority and just become one more talkback in the blockchain. Many would argue that the selfie replaces the memory of the victims by the glorification of the picture taker. Others argue that the personalization of their selfie 
makes the memory accessible to people of their younger generation who suffer from Holocaust fatigue or simply couldn't care less, or that it's an effective memory technique. The selfie can be construed as a way to inscribe oneself into the memory scape. This makes the I was there doubly reliable as it's conveyed both through the body and an emblematic site. Um, yet the placing of the body of the contemporary viewer at center is not an innovation of the digital age. In Israeli trips to Poland, students are often assigned the role of tomorrow's witnesses of Auschwitz and encouraged to imagine Shoah suffering through their own bodily discomfort. And video clips such as I Will Survive, in which a survivor and his children and grandchildren dance among the Holocaust remains to the tune of Gloria Gaynor's song, here posing inside a, a cattle car, pave the way for this transition. The profusion of digital media provides great opportunities as well as great challenges for the transmission of Holocaust memory, in part because the nature of collective memory and the understanding of the self are changing as well. As with previous introduction of new technologies and media products, memorial and educational institutions often claim that these practices are a falsification of history, a desecration of the dead, and an abandonment of social solidarity. But the practices will continue. And the sooner gatekeepers acknowledge the changes, the better equipped they will be to deal with them and transmit the Holocaust to future generations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jackie, can you just uh, uh, go out from your share screen? Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much for a fascinating uh, presentation. Our next speaker will be Dr. Karen uh, Randler from uh, Mount uh, Holyoke uh, uh, College, presenting uh, the forensic turn in Holocaust studies and the afterlife of the dead. Karen? I'm trying, hi, I'm here. I'm trying to share my screen. Okay. Oh, I see down here, okay. No, wait a second. You shared the wrong screen. Oh, I see. Okay. Should I go back? You can just go out and then try to do it again. I think it would be easier for you. Okay, here we are. Sorry about that. Okay. Great. So I wanted to thank the organizers, Daniela, Ronnie, and Boaz for putting together this conference. And I also wanted to acknowledge the Mandel Center for Holocaust Research at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And in fact, I'm feeling quite bereft because I had started to work on a project in which I was looking at a set of photographs in collections by British and American liberators and looking at the texture of the photographs, the lightness, darkness, and in particular, looking at the reverse sides of the photographs, the versos, and using this material as, as forensic material to revisit and to look more slowly, so to speak, at some of the iconic uh, images of the Holocaust dead and, and corpses that, that we are so used to seeing. And I wanted to also mention that when I use the term Holocaust corpse, of course, I don't want to consolidate or collectivize all the individual um, individuals that, have, that, that were killed and that we, of course, need to pay attention to the different origins of, uh, of the regions where they came from, the manner in which they were killed, et cetera. So I'm using that as a, as a placeholder, so to speak. So I just wanted to clarify that. So, um, I want to say a few words about what I mean by the forensic turn, and many of you um, will be familiar with the plethora of literature and research that's being done by a number of scholars, and I'm going to put this up, so if you want to photograph it, go ahead. Um, so the forensic turn signifies the increased attention to and work on the material remains of the Holocaust including not just human remains, but also the geological and geographical attributes of their location, their relationship to other objects, structures, and ecologies. And I suggest that the attention to the materiality of the human remains has shifted away from the evidentiary 
uh, to a practice of surrogate memorialization. So the major question of my current project, uh, how does the visual representation of corpses in the aftermath of mass violence manifest the tension between the role of human remains as evidentiary material, the forensic turn, and the desire among survivors and others to properly bury the dead as grievable subjects, in what I call forensic imagination. So how does the forensic visual turn in Holocaust studies transform corpses as collectivized objects of violence into individualized subjects of mourning? So I think the forensic turn in Holocaust studies has opened up possibilities for exploring this tension. That is, just as forensic workers are concerned with identifying remains from an evidentiary perspective, they've also developed a, que a keen awareness and practice of commemoration and attention to the rights of the dead to a dignified burial. The rekindling of interest in Holocaust killing sites, of course, has a direct precedent in the work of other forensic archeologists and anthropologists who began in the mid 1980s to exhume uh, corpses at mass graves in Latin America, more recently in Spain, former Yugoslavia, and indeed, unfortunately, throughout the globe. The impetus for their work included the desire to identify the remains and the cultural imperative to handle the remains with respect by providing opportunities for the remaining survivors, um, descendants, or surrogate communities to properly bury their dead after decades of uncertainty. In order to keep up with the forensic investigations and ethical issues involved, a commission convened, and some of you may have been there, on May 14th, uh, 2017 at Yad Vashem to establish a protocol, a series of guidelines for how to deal with Holocaust era human remains. And so again, this emphasis on not necessarily disturbing or uninterring remains, but rather um, working with the, the advanced technologies to protect them, to keep them undisturbed. So then my question is, even as the remains are, are present, um, how does forensic imagination, namely the visual representation of the, the corpses that we already know through their, their prolific circulation, um, how might we return to these initial visual representation of Holocaust corpses um, as a new way to look at photographs um, as forensic remains. So I'm interested in tracking how, by whom, and for what purpose references to Holocaust corpse images are mobilized and instrumentalized in the wake of um, other instances of mass violence and even structural violence through mass mediation and their placement within a larger context of the subsequent um, incidences of mass violence, forced disappearance, and displacement. So I draw from Susan Shipley's concept of, foreign, of a forensic imagination. And as she points out, the forensic turn is not simply a collection of data for the purposes of documentation, but also, quote, the creative retrieval and mobilization of affects. So I'm suggesting that we, we take another look at the iconic corpse Holocaust photos in light of the proliferation of other corpses, many of which are individualized in other um, examples of, of mass and, um, and indirect violence. So for example, um, if we look at the images, and I forgot to warn that I'm showing images of the dead, I apologize, particularly in our current situation. Um, you know, you'll recognize Alan Kurdi, who was a Syrian refugee who drowned and washed up on, on a Turkish beach. And only after his dead body was proliferated throughout mass media, did we see him as a living, grievable human being. So he, in some ways, the corpse does the work that the rest of the community, the global community, has not done in ignoring the root causes of the, um, of the, the, the death in the first place. I mean, there are other examples. You'll recognize you know, the bodies of Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez and his daughter, Valerie. Again, this is a family photo. We would not know these people until they were drowned or killed. Um, so I want to raise questions, however, about the slippage that occurs when we place other 
corpses, other dead in relationship to the forensic work that's being done um, on Holocaust. So you'll recognize this image very present uh, to us of, of the pandemic, which has become almost iconic itself of, of a mass grave on Hart Island in New York. And also the unsettlement, the emotional unsettlement of not having access to the dead an unsettlement that some Holocaust survivors have, uh, have, have been reminded of in their own experiences in this time of the pandemic. At the same time, um, again, I want to caution, I want to look more closely at the slippage in the ways that we are creating these family resemblances, so to speak, between the Holocaust corpses and the corpses of other forms of mass and um, structural violence. So I have one minute. I know. Great. So I, I have many, many images that I'm not going to get to, but basically what I'm looking at is how images that we are all familiar with and that have circulated you know, since the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust, to what extent they've been instrumentalized and that in fact, very briefly, were they forensic material. In many ways, they became um, imaginaries to represent particular emotional affects um, here you see um, a large, uh, enlarged photo mural, photo mural that was exhibited at the Library of Congress um, after the war in 1945. And again, if I had more time, I would analyze, look at the gaze here, the gaze of the spectators in the midst of these bodies. Um, this is an image when you walk into the Holocaust Museum, of course, you are confronted with um, corpses from the Ordorf uh, concentration camp. And you know, I could, I, I could go on and on, but I wanted to end with, again, my plea for going back to the, to the physicality of these images and, and, and how um, a re-seeing of them puts them in a different frame and in some ways does beckon us to be careful about how we are putting them in um, in relationship or in, yeah, in a relationship to other images of, of dead bodies. And um, so I look more at the, the composition, the ways in which the verso of this particular image has this uncanny resemblance in its form. Um, and this, the verso is a, is a cutout from a Nazi brochure that celebrates the, the feats of the maritime, you know, the Nazi maritime army. Um, I think I, I want to stop here with this real haunting watercolor, which was a gift given by a survivor who was a graphic artist um, to um, Major Sharp, who was one of the liberators at Bergen-Belsen. And I think, again, this image has not been digitized. It has not been proliferated. And there are so many other um, air, um, moments when we need to go back and look at how to uncollectivize, so to speak, the, the corpses of the Holocaust. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, can you just uh, step yes. out the, great, thank you. Uh, so our next speaker uh, is Dr. Avino Ampat from University of Connecticut, who will present uh, Trauma, Testimony and Time, Virtual Memory, of the Shoah and COVID-19. Okay, great, thank you. I'm just gonna uh, open up the slideshow here. So um, thank you to the, uh, to the, you can see that, yeah. Thank you to the conference organizers um, in the Western uh, Galilee and thank you to uh, all the fellow panelists and thank you to everyone around the world. Um, this is, very exciting, and I appreciate that you've organized this uh, for all of us to join together and, and think together here uh, these past two weeks. So I have a, a number of projects that I've been working on, uh, new areas of Holocaust research, but I interpreted the call of the conference organizers to focus on how the present moment may influence or shape memory of the Holocaust. I do bring to this the lens of my uh, recently completed book project, which examines how and why the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising became the focal point of Holocaust memory, both in the first year after the revolt and in the aftermath of the war. On one foot, 
uh, by the fifth anniversary mm -hmm. of the revolt, mm -hmm. when Rappaport's monument was dedicated in Warsaw, Jews around the world projected diverse religious, political, and historical interpretations onto the last battle of Warsaw's Jews, making the dramatic framework of the event sufficiently flexible as to absorb a broad range of Jewish responses to the Shoah, while encoding April 19th and then eventually uh, the 27th of Nisan as the date for commemorations and as Hasya Diner writes as, quote, the prism through which the Holocaust would be remembered, unquote. So to fast forward to my focus then on this year's commemorations, what is the impact of the global pandemic on collective memory of the Shoah? More broadly, I suppose this connects to an ongoing concern I have with how we remember the Shoah in the 21st century. How do we use the present to understand the past? And how does the past help us understand the present? Can we find any meaning in mass death, especially in a time when we confront the prospect of this global pandemic, as the two previous papers have alluded to? The meaning of that memory has evolved over the past 75 years, while the Holocaust has become a cornerstone of contemporary Jewish identity. Nonetheless, even as paradoxically distance from the event seems to demonstrate that the Shoah or the Holocaust has become a central component of both contemporary American and Israeli Jewish identity, the inability to convey the traumatic nature of the experience means that memory of the event is constantly mediated and reformatted for social, cultural, and political purposes, while the true nature of the event still remains elusive or incomprehensible. I do not have time here to discuss the research that reflects on the impossibility of conveying the trauma uh, Amos Goldberg's research, for example, or on how the memory of the Shah is mediated by language and place, as Hannah Polin Galai demonstrates, or institutions mediate the memory, like Noah Schenker's research shows, or the types of memory described by Christopher Browning in Remembering Survival, or as some of the other papers get into, the impact of descendants of survivors on the shaping of post memory. Instead, what I'd like to do now is focus very specifically on the collective virtual commemorations that took place this year in the midst of the global pandemic. This is a picture from last year, I just wanna note. In 2020, as the global pandemic began to shut down the world, we observed Passover, marking seders and performing memory with immediate family only, or for some through virtual Zoom seders. And two weeks later on Yom HaShoah, we mark the 75th anniversary of liberation with a spate of virtual commemorations all over the world, some of which attempted to recreate Holocaust commemoration rituals using Zoom in real time, and others which opted for asynchronous videos that could be observed in the comfort of one's own home. These rituals still, as Jackie alluded to, reinforce the divide between institutional memory shaped by state actors, museums, and memorial entities, and more private forms of memory, such as a Zikaron Basalon type event. Two tendencies, though, seem to come together in uh, 2020 amidst the virtual commemorations uh, in COVID-19. Most of these commemorations were online attempts to perform the same rituals that have marked Yom HaShoah for years. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, both on April 19th and on the 27th of Nisan, which this year fell on the 20th and 21st. And two, these commemorations also continue to mark anxiety over the passing of the survivor generation, as has been alluded to. How will we remember without survivors? Who will remember for us? And did the anxiety of the present moment, which included in the United States the bizarre, bizarre spectacle of right-wing white nationalists invoking Nazi imagery to protest government attempts to keep them safe, a desire for connection and an attempt to find solace in greater suffering from the past spur even greater involvement in virtual commemorations than ever before. Jack Klieger, a child of survivors and president and CEO of the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York, noted that, quote, this year's virtual annual gathering of remembrance is exactly the type of initiative that will carry Holocaust memory into the future. And you can see a virtual background behind him of the Museum of Jewish Heritage. The New York ceremony marked the 75th anniversary of liberation and combined remarks by dignitaries, survivors, and their descendants, music and videos from previous commemorations that could not be recorded this year, 
and of course, a recorded FaceTime call with Dr. Ruth. At Yad Vashem, a ceremony which had no audience and a solitary bugler in the Warsaw Ghetto Square commemorated this year's theme, Jews Saving Jews, which did not require much of a leap for those seeking to draw connections. In recorded remarks, uh, President uh, Ruvi Rivlin argued that even though, quote, regrettably, we do not meet tonight in Warsaw Ghetto Square at Yad Vashem, as we do every year, we cannot let the threats of the past cloud the, uh, th threats of the present cloud the memory of the past. Noting that it was the human spirit that vanquished the Holocaust, uh, Rivlin brought his remarks fully into the present moment, explaining the solidarity and common obligation which saved Jews during the war meant that, quote, the current pandemic occupying the entire world, the war against a non-human, invisible, and indiscriminate foe only emphasizes our common obligation to human solidarity, to mutual responsibility, and to the uncompromising battle against anti-Semitism and hatred, which also spread like an infectious disease from one to another." Unquote. Amidst the global pandemic then, in a time of increased anxiety plus social distancing and embrace of virtual technology, we could also see a continued attempt to find solace in virtual memories of survivors who demonstrated resilience. And as Jackie and Norma alluded to, and I think some of the other papers will as well, as the new dimensions and testimony project suggests, providing evidence that we can achieve perhaps some form of immortality. And I'm sure we'll discuss this in the, in the Q&A. Uh, this is a, a screenshot of a video from April 5th, two weeks before Yom HaShoah, in which the famed CBS 60 Minutes news program aired a story on the Shoah Foundation's New Dimensions and Testimony program that they obviously had recorded, uh, been working on long before the COVID-19 pandemic, but which seemed to take on additional significance in the midst of the current crisis. Scott Pelley introduced the story by noting that it recalled another time when the world was convulsed by global crisis. The Shoah Foundation, they suggested, had harnessed the technology of the present to continue speaking with the past. Leslie Stahl, you can see her back here, began the segment speaking with Aaron Elster, who survived two years in hiding in an attic, noting, quote, this was unlike any interview we have ever done. It wasn't the content that was so unusual. It was the fact this interview was with a man who was no longer alive, unquote. We can discuss all of this in the Q&A, but this is still all an illusion mediated through so many layers of distance, a virtual replica of a human speaking in a language that cannot adequately transmit the nature of the trauma, transporting us through time to a place where we do not want to be. This is also one person's memory, which becomes a stand-in for the memory of millions. Instead of a focus on the memories, and if we can think back to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, an example, instead of focusing on the memories of uh, Klepfish or Edelman or Lubetkin or uh, Zuckerman or Anilevich, will we be left instead with the memories of Gutter and Kor and Elster and Schloss and 20 other virtual survivors using artificial intelligence? Only time will tell. Even so, we are still distancing from the trauma of the Shoah. We seek meaning in the stories of survival, not stories of death. We, seek, uh, we relativize the trauma of the present by juxtaposing to the enormous trauma of the past. But we continue to find meaning in the collective memory of the past that suits the needs of the present. If we remember the trauma of the past, it is to say, today is not as bad. And if we seek a silver lining, it is for hope of resilience, communal solidarity, and collective obligation. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you could just uh, step out of the shared screen. Um, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Victoria Grace Walden from University of Sussex, and she will present uh, Holocaust commemoration from physical togetherness to online only. Thank you very much, Riley. Thank you to the conference organizers again, and thank you to everyone for attending this virtual presentation. And I hope that this talk follows on quite nicely from the, the previous ones. It's always nice to see our panel becomes quite uh, fluid when none of us have met before. Um, so in this short talk, Holocaust commemoration from physical togetherness to online only, I want to offer some observations regarding how in this year, of many 75th anniversaries related to the Holocaust and the end of World War II. 
we have seen events transform into online only provision. And then I will introduce some questions to guide, I hope, thinking about how we might further integrate digital technologies into Holocaust commemoration in the future. My conclusions from some initial observations of 2020 events is that many institutions are still ingrained in traditional broadcast media logics, even when they're using the digital. And whilst these more historical logics lend themselves perhaps to the traditional conventions of commemorative practice, now is a great opportunity to think about how we might disrupt such conventions and traditions and could prepare for doing these things in a digital age. These issues are more a topics of my new blog, digitalholocaustmemory.com, which is part of a much wider um, and growing project. Um, and I'd really like, kind of in the spirit of thinking about digital commemoration, to encourage you to continue these discussions and thoughts in the coming weeks um, on Twitter. I put my, my handle there and create the hashtag for anyone that wants to um, join in some discussions. <coughs> yeah, so what is commemoration? Um, simply put, and this is repeated in much of the academic literature, is an event that relates to a specific time, a particular place, a coming together, and this is really important, that co of commemoration with our commemorators, to collectively remember a historical moment through performance of prescribed formalized action and language. Perhaps, um, not necessarily in contrast, but in a, in a different uh, definition, when we think about digital logics, we're thinking about the computational and perhaps in tension with that, the experiential, so the human and the machine coming together, the networked uh, and on the fly. So I'm just going to go to some very brief examples <coughs> of events held online this year. On one hand, commemorations during lockdown have continued with an element of physical covenantness to staff at the Bergenfeld and Memorial, and this was repeated at other concentration camps, <coughs> still laid reefs, even though the public was not invited. Um, and then on the other hand, sites offered more extensive online content here, um, pre-recorded videos on a special site created by the Bergenfeld education team. And then there were um, video kind of live broadcasts, so here's one for the Gizan Liberation yesterday, and then UK Yom Hashara event um, last month. So just to um, talk through some of my observations. Um, so I talked briefly there about, um, on one hand, some pre-recorded content, but a lot of organizations moving towards live broadcasts, which reiterates this idea of coming together at a specific time. The social distancing reflaying, again, is the sense of the, the site being very significant. And we see performance there, not just in these real places, but also online. Um, one example was the ritualistic candle lighting for Yom HaShoah, um, here you can see some examples of people on Twitter um, who are showing that they are participating, that we are here too, we're doing this, even if we might not be in the same space. So for the last um, two or three minutes of this talk, I want to focus on um, some of the questions really about how we might think about doing commemoration in more, in more, more digital ways, in ways that engage digital logics. Um, I'm going to shape this around three problems. I don't have all the answers yet, as you can see some of this research is about events that happened yesterday. Um, so this is the beginning of thinking about this topic in more detail. Um, so in terms of thinking about the problem of site, Jay Winter argues that physical sites are only relevant to memory as long as they retain symbolic and aesthetic value. Their concrete presence can also be problematic for representing or memorializing absence. And commemorations need to engage more with below up memory alongside top down or institutional memory. So thinking in terms of the digital, then we might ask some of these questions. If sites are fragile and more at risk of losing their symbolic and aesthetic value to collective memory as time passes, what might a network flowing participatory dispersed commemorative model in the digital realm achieve? And what happens if we detach or at least semi-detach from the specific geography of a site or at least disperse from it and consider it perhaps the nexus or the core of a wider network of memory? Um, the second then is the problem of togetherness. <clears throat> I think Berkheim describes togetherness in a beautifully poetic way um, and this is, these are his words. He says a sort of electricity is generated from their closeness and quickly launches them into an extraordinary height of exaltation. Here he's describing um, how the sacredness of commemoration emerges from the people coming together. And for Durkheim, it was this coming together in action that was most central to um, what created this the sacredness of commemoration, more than the, the physical site, although this is still important in his work. We might ask him how might digital commemoration transcend the specifics of both time and place and still enable us to come together. 
Did it allow us to not only assemble at the same time, but across times and places, opening up not only a new digital space for commemoration, but perhaps a longer continuity to it as well? The third problem um, <coughs> I want to focus on is the problem of formalised performance. Um, when we think about that candle lighting, how can you tell that everyone is definitely doing it? You know, people pick you up, does it matter? You know, is there a kind of more blurring between private actions and public actions? So there's many presumptions that the digital is immaterial, and this suggests it's kind of a, offers a disembodied uh, machinic uh, experience. You know, as I say, you know, we've seen with the candle lighting for Yom HaShoah how deeply tied the digital is to our embodied existence within the lived world. People still lit candles, at least those that published it on Twitter did. And Wolf Pernstein is critical that Holocaust memory institutions mostly use the digital to broadcast information rather than taking advantage of its hyperconnectivity. Whilst we see Holocaust deniers increasingly indulging in the latter with increasing horrific consequences. And so some final questions then related to performance. What might a more hyper-connected form of commemorative practices look like? Could it break away from the formalized broadcast nature of traditional commemorations led from the front and from above, which encourage us to do the same bodily action on cue? Is there a way that a more hyper-connected commemorative practice might draw a memory from below as much as from a memory from above? And when we start expanding these kind of commemorative practices in this way, is it still commemoration? And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Very precise. Seven minutes by the second. Admirable. Thank you. Our last speaker is uh, Lucas Wilson uh, from Florida Atlantic University, who will present his paper, uh, Preoccupied Longing Toward a Definition of Post Nostalgia. Lucas, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Greetings from Ch Chile, Toronto. Um, first of all, of course, thank you to the conference organizers. This has uh, been great. I, I think this is the, the largest turnout for any paper I've ever given, so I'm just thrilled right now. Um, but I'll jump right into, into my, my paper. A number of literary and cultural theorists have explored the relationship between nostalgia and the Holocaust as it pertains to the children of survivors known as the second generation. Most notable among this group are Eva Hoffman and Marion Hirsch as daughters of Holocaust survivors themselves, Hoffman in Life in Translation and Hirsch in Family Frames and Ghosts of Home, each provide accounts of their nostalgic affections for the homelands of their families before the Shoah. Though not born in the countries of their parents' births, both Hoffman and Hirsch describe pining for their families' native countries with a measure of nostalgia for the pre-Holocaust world as if they themselves had once lived there. I want to draw attention to this enigmatic phenomenon of inherited quote unquote nostalgia. Although these members of the second generation experience a profound longing for and attachment to the time and place of their fam families' pre show lives, neither Hoffman nor Hirsch were alive before the Holocaust and neither ever lived in their parents' birthplaces. Hirsch highlights this enigma when she asks, quote, how could a place I had never touched and which my parents left under extreme duress really be home? I had experienced no actual time there at all, end quote. The questions then remain, what precisely is this inherited nostalgia and what can be said about it? As a way of responding to these questions, I propose a new term, post-nostalgia. Post-nostalgia, as I conceive of it with respect to the descendants of Holocaust survivors, names the imaginative response of the second generation and indeed the third generation, the grandchildren of survivors, that, that attenuates the effects of their inherited traumas and embodied knowledge that stem from their progenitors' experiences during the Holocaust. Post-nostalgia isn't an adopted nostalgia, though it is not nostalgia as such for a place and time that descendants have never lived but long for as if they have. This intimate desire to quote-unquote reincarnate particular geography is what Pierre Nora refers to as lieu de mémoire or sites of memory that are imbued with stories of family life prompts descendants of survivors to seek imaginative entry into their family's pasts that preceded the Shoah. Post-nostalgia articulates a longing for life before Nazi occupation a longing that preoccupies descendants of survivors with their imaginative perceptions of the lands of their forebears. It is thus a yearning for family existence in a particular geography before the Shoah, for Jewish livelihood before mass trauma, that is for life before Nazi decimation. This fantasy of pre-Shoah life and enabling fiction mix, mixed with fact that is largely a function of imagination creates, as Svetlana Boim suggests, a double consciousness though such a double consciousness is further complicated for the descendants of Holocaust survivors. Boyne refers to double consciousness as the main feature of the exilic experience, quote, 
a double exposure of different times and spaces, a constant bifurcation, end quote. But for the second and third generations, they are not only subject to a double consciousness in regard to where they live now and where their families once lived. Indeed, the places where their families once lived are doubly refract refracted through their progenitors' pre shoah lives, as well as their Holocaust experiences. As such, the descendants of survivors possess multiply divided and affectively complex consciousnesses that hold in tension their families' exilic experiences. As already noted, several scholars have outlined the phenomenon of second generation inherited nostalgia, without terming it post-nostalgia to be sure, but little work has examined briefly or at length the third generation's similar attachments. A number of men and women in the third generation make so-called pilgrimages to the lands of their forebearers, and in doing so, these descendants of survivors attempt to imaginatively, fi imaginatively fill in absence, to piece together narratival fragments of family life, to reintroduce Jewish life where it was decimated, and to connect to family roots that were burned up during the Holocaust. These grandchildren of survivors commonly attempt to discover pre-Shoah life by visiting the sites of Jewish and family life in the native lands of their forebearers. Of course, their quote-unquote recovery of pre-Shoah life is always already partial, incomplete, and ultimately impossible, but such a response nonetheless offers an avenue for generative coming to terms with their inherited legacy of loss. loss. In truth, it ought to be noted that this post-nostalgic yearning that I'm naming is also inflected with malaise, uh, by malaise that stems from the Holocaust, for how could any perception of pre-Shoah life not be colored by the Holocaust? But the post-nostalgic impulse is one that actively resists this malaise, especially when attempting to recover a sense of home, again, whether or not this post-nostalgic recovery is realized. Post-nostalgia, I argue, is an, is an adaptive response to the traumatizing effects of inherited knowledge of the Holocaust. Indeed, as is the case, for example, in Jeremy Drace's We Won't See Auschwitz, a graphic novel by a French author, a number of grandchildren of survivors intentionally circumnavigate, circumnavigate sites of Holocaust atrocity. Re uh, reconstructing, or more accurately, constructing life from before informs members of the third generation self-conceptions that employ the past to shed light on the present and certainly the future, which can thus be understood as an expression of tikkun atzmi, a repair of the self, to which Alan Elberger points. The irony is, as is the case with many descendants of survivors, that such a new self-conception is others-focused. In order to understand, better understand themselves, members of the third generation attempt, attempt to plumb the depths of their long family history in order to fashion a more integrated sense of self, which fits into a larger narrative and provides them genealogical connection and a greater depth of existential meaning. For members of the third generation, this effort to find distance from their family's holocaustic pasts is ironically to come into contact with, to temporarily touch, feel, smell, see vestiges of their family's pre-show lives. Yet this distancing vis-a-vis -vis encountering their family's life before the Holocaust in situ is an, is an effort to resist being trapped in and bound to their inherited traumas. Avoiding sites of atrocity and exclusively making pilgrimages to sites of family life can be understood as a distinctly third generation project. However partial and or incomplete such pilgrimages to sites of pre-show life are in remembering that which was destroyed, third generation pilgrimages serve in part as a way to avoid literal and imagined sites of trauma in order to avoid being re-traumatized by the Holocaust narratives they've heard throughout their lives. Their refocusing on Jewish, Jewish and family life allows for generative self-understanding by looking backwards before the Shoah, members of the third generation are able to reoccupy the here and now, which ultimately prompts and makes way for them to begin moving forward toward a more habitable future. These so-called pilgrims search for alternative lives that could have been otherwise had history run a different course. That is, they are in pursuit of different existences that could and should have been their own, but emphatically were not. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, thank you all. We have a lot of questions. Uh, so, I'll try uh, to start. I, I can promise that we'll uh, get everything, but I'm trying to, to at least have questions for all the, of the speakers. So, the first is from Diana. Uh, and it's to uh, it's for uh, uh, Jackie and uh, Norma. Uh, would you say that the selfie is really a fully new phenomenon? Uh, in the past, people visited the historical uh, sites and took pictures there, but the object of interest in the picture uh, was the historical site uh, or uh, artifact. Does a selfie change that uh, by uh, in? Uh, inserting the, photograph the photographer uh, as the object? 
Norma, would you like to answer? I can try to answer that. I think that there is there is a paradigmatic change in the digital times. So we didn't have this kind of technology before. There is a new technology. If we think about memory, and I see that there is another question about memory. Memory, we understand memory as something that is mediated, right? It was mediated through the uh, uh, videos. Now it's mediated through uh, holograms. And we, we try to understand this mediation. I think that the, the selfie is also one different kind of mediation, that it, it can be used in different ways. And it's part of a new paradig paradigm that is, has to do with a new generation, a digital generation that uses selfies in order to, as a kind of embodiment of the memory. So this is how we understand it. We don't say, we, we have to understand what it does. We don't know yet what it does, but we do understand that there is something new here. Thank you. Um, so we'll be back uh, with Norma and Solman, but, but uh, and uh, Jackie, sorry, but uh, for Kara now, uh, so Boaz wrote, uh, I would question the use of corpse photos uh, in Holocaust education setting. Uh, what, do you, uh, what, what do you feel about it? Karen? Yeah, um, I'm actually going to try. There's a couple of questions out there, so I'll try to pull them together. Um, first of all, uh, I wanted to, um, someone else mentioned lynching photos. And I think when we, as teachers or as researchers, when we reproduce images of violence committed to bodies, I think there's a way in which we need to know who our audience is. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a way in which hurt bodies don't need to be. Uh, re shown over and over and over again. And I'm, I'm very conscious also of my own um, sometimes difficulty in figuring out a way how to convey, how to analyze, how to take apart the, the image without showing it. And so I think one way of doing that is to always predicate what I show with the question of agency. Like who decides how this picture gets disseminated. So if you think of Emmett Till's mother, for example, um, she decided to have an open coffin. She decided to show the horror that had, had, had happened to her son. So there's a way in which we don't have that agency for Holocaust, um, uh, the, the dead. Um, and, and so the question is, who are the surrogate keepers of that, of that gate, so to speak, and what, what we show and what we don't. But I think there is, you think of the object, um, photographs that are mediated in the media, like whose bodies get shown? Like which corpses do we think we can throw around in the media in full color over and over and over again? And how are they instrumentalized? So I think I would want students to do this slow looking, look at one, do a deep, thick description of a particular um, image, and somehow understand that what they're looking at are human, are human beings that, and even as dead human beings, they, they have rights. Um, there was another question about, um, you know, the people who do forensic architecture, Eli Weissman, et cetera, there's a way in which they document the violation of human rights, the, the, the committing of crimes against humanity without reproducing dead bodies. So very often they create the visual scene of the killing or, or, or place the responsibility on particular groups without once again having to expose um, and circulate the body. So I think there are ways of using advanced technologies, forensic technologies um, to do that. So I'll just stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'll go uh, uh, to a question for Victoria by Jackie. Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, is there a fundamental change in the way uh, we remember and create solidarity? And if so, what are its implications? Thank you for that question. I think it links quite nicely to to a later one that said about what do you think about uh, commemorations might be next year. Um, 
hide the fact that um, a lot of um, where a lot of Holocaust institutions use the digital is still very much like broadcast media. There isn't that kind of uh, engagement with a more um, network kind of logic of the computational. And there's very good reasons for that. We've seen this with the Zoom uh, Zoom um, bombing and with some of the Yom Hashoah events where neo Nazis um, came into the, the events. Uh, and that's something that we obviously want to avoid. And the wider um, access we have to an event, which happens online, and we see it today in a very positive way with so many people at the, today's uh, event, um, that, that you know, you're opening the door, you're making it more easy for those that you don't want to be in that space to come in there. Um, I don't think, and I think this is down to the fact that you know, these events had to go online so quickly, that much was different in how, um, uh, how they did the commemorations. I still think, yeah, I think the idea of you know, filming the laying of reefs um, still happened. It still had to be done. And I thought that was very interesting. We see it in London here that people had to go to places um, and the ceremoniousness. And we had performances on VE Day in the UK in, in the Albert Hall. And I think, why? It was, why? Why was it seen as so necessary? And I think it's really interesting. Why did, when we're worried about people's safety and going outside, did we, for the need to go to these particular historical places and do these particular performances and that's just something about how we perceive commemoration to be. Um, I think one of the things that's been very very interesting is that I feel that um, in this kind of lockdown and this focus to uh, on the digital is that the care for survivors has become more foregrounded to the public. We know a lot of hol Holocaust institutions aren't just about doing um, Kind of using survivors to do talks as educational resources but actually do a huge amount of work behind the scenes or in the background about care for these individuals and creating community around survivors um, and i think that's come more to the fore that this is actually you know getting young people to tweet in messages to survivors for example has happened at the uk holocaust um, educational trust have been doing work on this and other organizations have as well um, so i think that's something in terms of solidarity that's come to the foreground perhaps some of the more kind of behind the scenes work that organizations do has become more obvious to the public um, but I don't really think much has changed in what we've done I think there's a huge potential that we could now take stock and think about what could we do with the digital now we've had to do something quickly and I think this is the same in education I think we're all facing this in universities at the moment uh, we've done something quickly and it's maybe not been brilliant and then we've done the best we can in the situations we are what could we do that could be really radical and interesting if we had time and I think that's kind of what I was trying to get out with the, with the paper. Thank you so much. So I'll take two questions to Avinoam uh, that I think that one of them is also relevant to Victoria and maybe also Jackie and Norma, so Pet and, and others. So we'll start with a question by Atina. Uh, I wonder whether uh, the uh, continual uh, evocations of uh, togetherness and collective experience constitutes uh, a painful, absurd, disconnect with the uh, ob uh, <coughs> sorry, obstinate uh, reality of uh, physical uh, separation. And the second question uh, from Boaz uh, uh, to Avinom and Victoria, you both showed uh, the digital uh, commemorations of this year. What do you think uh, will Holocaust commemoration next year? Uh, will it be uh, much more digital than before? Uh, the coronavirus. So uh, we'll start with uh, Avinon. Sure. So I'll start, and I'm sure I'm sure Victoria will also have some some to add or plenty to add to this discussion too. So to um to respond to uh, Atina's point about um you know the uh, continual evocations of togetherness uh, constituting an absurd disconnect from the obstinate reality of physical. Like I think I think you raise an important point, which is even reflected in kind of this enterprise that we're engaging in here, right? So we're sort of trying to uh, come up with some sort of replacement connection for the reality that we're sort of all isolated in our, um, I'm sitting in my son's bedroom now upstairs in my house, not in Yad Vashem, but we're sort of creating this um, sort of alternate reality for ourselves. And um, I, I think, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I think this is a, a really important question, right? This idea of sort of, um, and you could see it even in, um, you know, what I referenced in the the Rivlin remarks at Yad Vashem, sort of this idea, and it came up just in the question about solidarity. Um, 
the idea of creating sort of imagined community, which makes us feel better about our current reality. I, I suppose we're always doing that in one way or another, um, you know, and here in, in the United States, many of us have been doing this for the past few years, sort of creating imagined communities that take us away from our um, current reality to a certain extent, right? Like we always do that. It's a type of a defense mechanism. Um, as an aside, I'll just note that I've been avoiding watching uh, The Plot Against America, which is being broadcast here on, on HBO or was, um, until somebody said, hey, we should do a virtual program on it. And so I said, okay, I'll watch it. Because it's completely terrifying, right? To sort of, um, and it's fictional and it's imaginary, but it does remind us of our sort of current uh, present moment. That's just as an aside. I'll say that like these collective memory enterprises, right? I think we have to, and, and Victoria might want to comment on this too. There is this distinction between something we do together um, collectively, which uh, does create sort of a, a, a group as a group solidarity component. It's almost always political. Um, so in the immediate uh, aftermath of the war, like there was always a political agenda to the type of memory that would be shaped. And so we always have to be aware to what are the political agendas to like institutionally shaped forms of memory that are asking us to do it collectively versus as Vicky was just alluding to these sort of ground up individual, you know, remembering in your living room uh, enterprises. Um, and so I think, you know, maybe next year, I don't know, it, it'll be interesting to see like how much do we try to hold on? Is there a little bit of a struggle between the traditional forms of memorial practices that have uh, been taking place, more innovative forms that people try to, like this might just play out existing forces that are already there. Um, and that sort of continuing struggle between those two forces may play out in a different format. And maybe those who are more agile and nimble and more readily able to develop sort of digital forms of memory that um, are interactive and respond to a younger generation, those might end up winning out uh, more quickly than they would have um, under normal circumstances where these sort of institutional forms might have held on longer. So that'll be interesting. You know, I can't tell you, Boaz, uh, what the future is going to bring, but it might speed up certain processes that were already um, uh, taking place uh, beforehand. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop myself there. Okay. Uh, before I'll turn to Lucas, Victoria, do you want to add anything? Thank you. I mean, just very briefly, I think, um, I don't think things will change unless those discussions happen soon, very soon. I think when, as places are moving out of, of lockdown, and I know a lot of the international um, groups of more museums are meeting and talking about uh, things quite regularly now. And I think it's that dialogue um, continues, then something will change. But I think a lot of people, I get the sense of kind of craving that, uh, uh, we talk about new normality and things that are going to change, but actually a lot of people seem to be craving what they consider normality. They want to go back to what they had before. So there seems to be this tension between, I think, in academia and cultural institutions, we want to change something. We want to learn something. We want this to be a researchable, learnable moment in our life. And perhaps that's a way of get, dealing with the situation um, and feeling useful, maybe. And then on the other hand, I think a lot of people just want something that was there before to come back. So I think there will be this interesting tension. And I think, uh, I mean, I was just kind of talking about this idea of, of tensions. And I think this will be when it comes out of here and I think that disconnect is interesting between togetherness and and not being and physical separation um, the connectiveness of social media and I feel like I've seen more people uh, as an academic when after terms finished in the last few weeks than I normally would when I'd probably be hiding around in a room trying to get on with some research um, and I think actually in a way that um, we perhaps become hyper hyper connected in this sense we feel we must connect and see more faces more, more than we perhaps would have done before um, lockdown. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, Lucas, so we have several questions for you. Uh, one about a post-nostalgia yearning that uh, uh, from Hershey, who claims is, it, it is not nostalgia. Uh, people are trying to understand what was Ashkenaz and what was uh, Holocaust. You are talking about uh, the minority rather than the majority. Why? So this is one question. The other is from Megan. Uh, do you think there is any ties uh, between uh, uh, 3G uh, 
pilgrimages and uh, the, the efforts of some uh, 2G and 3Gs uh, to gain uh, citizenship of uh, uh, the country their uh, family uh, came from. 3G, three generation, two generation, that was uh, my uh, intention. Uh, the last one is from Jackie to Lucas, uh, saying that he thinks that the third generational nostalgia is not just a Holocaust phenomenon. It's central, for example, to immigrant experience. If you don't know it, you might uh, look at some of the work uh, currently drawn uh, on such practices. Uh, Lucas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so first to Hershey's comment, um, I actually say in my presentation that it is not nostalgia, right? Like, uh, very, uh, I'm very clear about that in the sense that this is that which, in the same way that post memory is not memory, it is that which smells, tastes, feels like memory, but it is not in and of itself memory. Um, I would argue that this, again, this is not nostalgia, because um, how can you yearn for a place you've never been? Um, again, it's, it's that which, um, is similar to and functions similarly to nostalgia, but of course, in and of itself, it is not. Um, as for the comment about I'm studying the minority rather than the majority, I mean, if that, to follow that logic, we wouldn't be doing queer studies, we wouldn't be doing black studies, we wouldn't be doing a lot of minority studies. So I think that at uh, that point, uh, I, I don't agree with um, in any sense. Um, but again, I understand, you know, why study something that's not as common, but if that were the case, again, a lot of fields and scholarly lines of inquiry would not be pursued. Um, as for the th uh, third generation pilgrimages to gain citizenship, yeah, that's exactly it. This, this idea of re in, in, in re reoccupying. Again, it's, it's imaginative. It's not that one actually is reoccupying because, again, they were never there. But this is something maybe if, you, if anyone's seen Unorthodox, um, it's a, a new show on Netflix. Uh, it's phenomenal. Uh, but it is this third generation uh, witness who returns to Germany. And I, I don't know if I would argue that she is motivated by post nostalgia. I think it's more so her trying to get out of her circumstances. Um, she's in an Orthodox community uh, and in a marriage that she doesn't want to be in. Um, but I do think that for people to go back to, mm -hmm. again, not, pardon me, not go back, but to go to these places and, and to gain citizenship is, is a recuperative effort. It's a way of uh, uh, reincarnating of course, not in the, the more common use of the word, but to, to carnate, to, to bring that family life back. I think that's absolutely the impulse. Um, as for third generation nostalgia, it's not, a, not, it's, right, it's not just a Holocaust uh, phenomenon. Uh, this is not something that's specific to uh, or exclusive to uh, grandchildren or children of Holocaust survivors. This, of course, again, going to, to Boehm's work where she talks about um, you know, uh, the exilic experience I think that this is something that would um, resonate with a lot of communities, particularly communities affected by mass atrocity. Thank you so much. I'll try to conclude with uh, the a last question that is referred by Janine to all of you. And please try to be very consistent with your answers that we, so that we will have time for the conclusion of the conference. Uh, so this is a question that is uh, addressed to all of you. Uh, it seems uh, as if the, uh, these papers work with the, a kind of spectrum of authenticity, uh, authenticity in which uh, a representation, image, sound, sight is treated as either more or less authentic. Uh, it has to do with uh, how that uh, representation is mediated technologically. How you find uh, this uh, uh, implicit or explicit uh, uh, spectrum of more or less authentic uh, to be problematic. How have you uh, uh, grappled with, uh, with it in your work? And we can start with uh, Jackie and Norma. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Look, I, as, a, as also a scholar of, of coming really at it from not only from ritual but from tourism, um, Authenticity is a word that uh, makes me inherently suspicious. Um, I think that um, there is a lot of social construction of what, what we call um, authentic. Um, at the same time, at some level, right, we, we, we long for it as if there is a, a kind of a, a directness of our contact with the event as if we can get over, get around mediation by finding the authentic, and I don't think it's possible. We're, we're always already constructed. Yeah. Um, and um, we, we um, uh, 
it, it, it still, you know, raises questions as to um, uh, to what extent will I'm not sure if I call it authentic, but material objects, physical presence of of human of uh, of witnesses and survivors uh, continue to be important in a digital generation. Um, to what extent are the these do these digital images become real? After all, one can be um, convicted of of rape. Um, by actions that are performed over the internet without physical contact. And you probably people can think of many other cases, you know, where, yeah, the, you know, like we, we project into objects, we project a lot into these media images, even if some of it remains um, foreign to me as a, a digital immigrant rather than a digital native. So I don't use the word authenticity, but I think some of the issues that are raised by the move to it towards digitalization um, uh, mm -hmm. touch on some of the, the same the same questions. Thank you so much, Karen. Do you wanna uh, um, just answer? yeah, just just briefly? I think I've sort of answered this to some extent. I think that a, a much more productive term would be agency, and I think. In looking at these images, one needs to go beyond what one sees and understand the prov provenance of the image, how they're being circulated, how they're being reproduced, and also understand that, that viewers, and if we think of the classroom again, bring certain preconceived notions to the table. So one needs to unpack those preconceived notions. And also, I think we need to, um, in some ways, decolonize <laughs> the view. Um, I have students who are from Rwanda, who, who are from um, Sri Lanka, etc. So they're already bringing a particular res um, response to images of, of the dead that, that are much more, um, are much, it, it's, it, they, so I, I'm, it's been a long conference, I'm getting tired, but I hope <laughs> you understand what I'm trying to get at. I'll just stop. Thank you. Thank you. I just think that what Karen was trying to say is that there is an, a, a cultural difference of how people, uh, you know, uh, observe uh, the dead and, uh, you know, the, the forensic, uh, you know, the re human remains are, you know, the one, the, how we perceive it uh, as Jews is very different than how uh, uh, it is perceived in uh, Rwanda, uh, for example. So uh, thank you for that. Um, okay, so uh, um, Avinoam, Victoria, some, one of you want to try and answer? Um, Victoria, you want to go first and I'll follow you. Um, thank you. Um, I, I come from a media studies background, so we're always questioning the idea of authenticity and like Jackie's already said, um, you know, memory is, is, is mediated. Uh, when we go to commemoration, there's a kind of formalized uh, representation, things that have to be done as part of the ritual that are already set. Um, but there is this kind of, I would argue, kind of fetishization of the authentic, particularly in terms of the Holocaust. We talk about the authentic site opposed to the museum that's not at a uh, site of historical violence. Um, I've worked, um, uh, you know, when students want to touch a Holocaust survivor as if to touch that person is to somehow have an authentic embodied connection with the past. Uh, and we want to see authentic objects. We want to see the historical object, not the facsimile. Um, I, yeah, I, I wonder you know, if we sometimes forget when we go to sites that, um, that, that this mediation process is there. We think about it in newspapers, we question headlines, we question what we see on Twitter, but we don't think about museums as doing the same kinds of processes and mediations, obviously in very different contexts, in a much more controlled, institutionalized, not what better researched uh, process of mediation. Um, but I think it's important that when it, whatever form of uh, whatever media commemoration is being done through, whether that's Twitter or Zoom or in an authentic uh, site, um, that that doesn't make it any less kind of authentic as a coming together experience, as an experience commemorating and engaging in memory. Thank you. Have you done? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that these are all excellent points. And I think that the last point that you make about sort of 
authenticity is subjective, right? So um, it's it's all dependent on on sort of the. I don't think we can define something as more authentic than the other. And, and I think your point about sort of that it's, it's, um, it's in the eye of the beholder so that um, for those who are learning about it or those who are students or those who are visiting a museum, right? We, we can't sort of necessarily um, be the curators who define what is more authentic than something else. I do feel like um, I am at a Future of Holocaust Testimonies conference. So Boaz, uh, this is coming together quite nicely because these are all conversations that sort of, um, you know, come out of this, this study, right? Sort of how do we define um, testimony? What's the value of testimony that emerges after the war? I, I do think that there is this sort of um, distancing that takes place. And it's interesting to look at, you know, part of the larger context here is that we've all been talking about is how will we remember uh, the, the Holocaust without survivors? You know, what will the future of Holocaust memory be like? And I think one of the important things for context here is that we can look at the place of survivor testimony in the immediate post-war period, um, where it was much more complicated versus like the last 20 years where we sort of see kind of um, this valorization of, of survivor testimony and this great anxiety that now has developed over what will we do when there's no one here to remember for us, right? Which we've all talked about kind of um, is is doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Because how can you remember something you didn't experience, right? How can somebody remember something for you? Like we're all alluding to this in different ways, and but this is a great deal of the anxiety that's about that's about this. Um, and one of the things is the distancing that takes place that we never actually can connect to the trauma of the event itself. We can just hear from witnesses or survivors of the event itself. So there's a distancing that that takes place. In that, in that point. Although I will say to, to allude to Vicky's last point, which is that, you know, when students, and, and maybe this is also to something that Stacy brought up in the comments, when students meet with survivors um, and they hear survivor testimony in the classroom, it is like this authenticity of this is a real artifact that I uh, am, am able to hear and to meet and to come into contact with. Um, and, you know, no matter what we teach them or whatever kinds of lectures we do, that's usually the, the thing that students will remember the most, right? That encounter with the survivor that they then have. Um, and so we're trying to figure out like, well, well how do we replace that? Um, and this is where the, you know, the Shoah Foundation's uh, project tries to come up with sort of a replacement that you'll be able to have for that uh, direct encounter, that artifact itself. Although, as we've all said, right, it's all sort of mediated by a type of distance that, that takes place anyway. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Lucas, the last one. You here? Sorry, uh, this is for Avi's question. This is for the question for all of you about authenticity. Authenticity. Sorry, I'm tr just trying to see you. Okay. Um, could you could you repeat the question just one more time? Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Um, I'm trying to. I didn't realize to... the question was directed toward me. I apologize. Um, sorry. Just a second. A lot of remarks here. Sorry. So uh, the question is that it seems that uh, the papers uh, work on a kind of a spectrum of authenticity in which representation, the image, sound, sight uh, is treated as either uh, more or less authentic. Uh, it has to do with uh, how that representation is mediated technologically. And you can just uh, share your take on it shortly. Yeah, so if we, are, if we are to talk about in the context of, of the third generation and second generation and thinking specifically about authenticity, um, one quote that comes to mind is uh, Hirsch, as well as actually Hoffman, both of them talk about how um, their parents' memories were more real than their own memories of their own childhood. Um, and so thinking about authenticity, it seems like, um, you know, I think for the second generation when they want, you know, they're looking for authentic, quote unquote, uh, ways of working through or sites of trauma. They go to these sites of trauma um, and, and that's, that's the place that they try to 
um, find a sense of authenticity. Whereas I think what I'm trying to articulate with the third generation is that they go to sites, again, not, this is not obviously like every single third generation person does not go to the, you know, Auschwitz or does not go to Triblink or does not go to these different uh, sites of atrocity. Um, but that they go to these other sites, they go to these sites of Jewish life and family life more particularly um, as, as that which is most authentic. Um, and again, I think it's a way of, I shouldn't say most authentic, I don't think there's a hierarchy here, but I think that um, they, they, I don't know, I, I don't really know how uh, this would feed into the, the paper, but again, I'm trying to think of authenticity in the context of, of my paper, and I'm, I'm coming up with a blank, to be honest, and I don't want to just speak fine. like I just did for the past 30 seconds. No, that's fine. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank all of the, our speakers for a wonderful panel, and to give the floor to uh, Dr. Boaz Cohen uh, to conclude this uh, conference. Boaz? <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you all for coming. It was an amazing experience. I was thinking today that actually we have two issues uh, that came out from, uh, especially from uh, the way Vicky uh, put it uh, uh, in her responses. Uh, what is an authentic uh, conference? Uh, so before I talk about what is, uh, what, when we're talking about going back to normal, what are we going back to? So, but before that, I would like to say that uh, there is another issue here that went through all the days of all the sessions, and that's the question of ethics. So we have an ethical question. Let's start from the end about using corpse photos, reserving the dignity of the dead. We have, uh, by the way, I uh, think that showing naked uh, women, humiliated women a minute before they are shot, showing this to students is perpetuating the humiliation done by the uh, perpetrators. That this is something that ethically should not be done. At least it can be clouded in a pixel that so many options today, something should not be done. So the ethics of using photos and what photos? The ethics of third generation, uh, taking the place of their uh, parent, of their grandparents. Like we are now the survivors and we, I'm not talking about the, the really a radical stuff of putting your grandfather's number on your hand, but uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, how much are you going to fill in or are you willing to accept that you are not your grandfather? And then we get the, the, the first, uh, the, the second, I'm going from the end to the beginning, we had the second question about, of course, bio, uh, biological, bioethics, and, it, it, and actually on the panels, they were talking about ethical questions, ethical questions of working with uh, special education children, euthanasia, uh, uh, these issues, uh, the acceptance of, of what is right and what is wrong, even for a family third generation after that, and then we had the first session and we talked about sexual abuse. And then again, it's like, how do we res preserve the dignity of the, of the people we're writing about? How we uh, escape voyeurism when we talk about uh, sexual issues? The music you hear, if you hear, is uh, like Ba Omer is starting here now outside. And, uh, and uh, the question of... Uh, all this relates in my feeling that also to the question of agency. Uh, when we uh, talk about the victimhood of uh, uh, sexually abused children or women or, or men for that sense, when, uh, how do we preserve their dignity? So we have this dignity issue that is very, I'll close the window just a minute. <laughs> We have a dignity issue, uh, the question of respect to the people we are talking about, that we should think about. So actually, uh, what we show today is that Holocaust uh, uh, memory is both about, uh, is both about uh, uh, strengthening the ethical, uh, uh, infrastructure of the world we live in, but it's also about doing things ethically because we can very easily fall uh, 
we, uh, when we speak about the really hard things we speak about. Uh, this brings me to the, uh, not the ethical question, but the auth authenticity question. What is an authentic Holocaust conference? An authentic academic conference? So actually, I, uh, if I look at myself, I had a very good year. I had a conference in Yale. I had a, a, a three-day uh, of meetings in USAGMM. I met all the wonderful people in USAGMM. Uh, so I had a conference in Yale. I uh, had a conference in uh, Stockholm. I had a workshop I organized with Rena Buser on uh, children in crisis in Berlin, in Potsdam. So that was before Corona. <laughs> Missed out on several others after Corona. So what is now the normal? Now I had a chance to see so many people. We brought together people and we had to reach in our research in seven minutes, which is uh, astounding. We always uh, complain about the 20 minutes that they are not enough. And suddenly we had to put it on in seven minutes and people said worthwhile stuff. Uh, so I think all this really raises the question of where we are going uh, to be, uh, hopefully when everything goes back to whatever is normal. But uh, uh, I really look forward to meeting people in conferences and going to a museum, a real, using one day to go to a real museum, not seeing the Louvre on my computer. So this is something that uh, I think we all have. On the other hand, this is much like Janine wrote after the first day of the conference, this is really easy. No flights, no hotels, and we could put the washing in the, uh, in the washing machine, take it out, uh, prepare lunch, uh, we, we built it really nice. I mean, the, the, we did it from home. And uh, no major disruption of everyday life. So I think this is a challenge we'll be looking at. I'm, a, I believe that, I hope we will be kind of going back to face-to-face -face conferences on one hand, but that we keep on doing what we did uh, here because I think this is a, a very a worthwhile. I, I must say this is the second conference we are doing. And we did a, a small one on uh, we, uh, Western Galilee was a facilitator of establishing the Israeli Society for the History of Children, <laughs> and Israel Association for the History of Children. And we did a, a, a small conference before. We tried all the things we did here very professionally. We had a, a, a trial run on a small uh, children's uh, history conference in Hebrew uh, with Israelis. And, we, and I think this is really, something that we should keep doing, even if we'll be able to fly away and visit our friends on one hand. And, but I really hope we'll also be able to meet all of you face to face. Uh, we are planning for 2022, the sixth uh, Future of Holocaust Testimony Conference. We had five already uh, in the last uh, eight years. And we are looking for partners, and it does cost money to run such a conference. So we are looking for investing partners for partner un uh, universities, but that's 2022. In the meanwhile, we'll have to meet in other ways. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, all the team from Western Galilee who did the chairing. And uh, see you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It was really neat. Thank you. Wonderful Thank to you have all. this experience. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Zaraba. Thank you, everybody. Great to see everyone. Hello. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. The numbers go down on the clock. Zai gesund. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Really, thank you all for coming. It's like now we're standing in the in the door of the wedding and uh, of the hall and uh, doing the rounds. Leitraot <laughs> bekarav. Leitraot. Goodbye. And of course, when you come to the Galilee, to Israel, Western Galilee is the best place to come and visit. Absolutely. So uh, you're really welcome. Really invited. Thank you.